May I speak and may you hear the word of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. After I qualified as a teacher, I went and took my first job on the Isle of Wight. And for part of the time there, my flatmate and I hired an ex-Coast Guard cottage. It was in a lovely site, it was on a low cliff, and it overlooked the Solent, the sea that separates the island from the mainland. And when we had time and the weather was nice, we used to sit on the lawn, which separated the cottage from the, the cliff and the beach, and we used to look at that view. And as we looked out to the left, we saw Limington and the beginnings of the New Forest. And as we looked out to the right, we saw the area around Chichester and the South Downs. It was stunning, and it was an idyllic spot. But then, of course, we had a change, because as we were there one Friday afternoon, the wind grew stronger, and we experienced a sea storm. And the wind at first was steady, and it whipped the water into a white froth. And as we looked across to the mainland, we just saw white everywhere. The foam was covering the whole area. But then the wind increased. The wind really howled. The waves grew and were over 20 foot high. It didn't affect us, of course, on our cliff, but it did affect other people. Boats scurried for safety and were already in harbour if they'd heard the weather forecasts. But of course, next morning, we saw the damage. Houses had chimney pots removed and so on. Many of the small boats had been ripped from their moorings. One of them, one of the yachts, in fact, was wrecked at the bottom of the cliff. We went down to the beach to inspect it. And had we not known, we would not even have thought it was a yacht. There was hardly a piece of wood more than a foot in length. And when we walked along to Cowes, we saw that the harbour had been affected too. A harbour made of solid stone, Great blocks of many tons had simply been ripped out from the foundations and now lay in the sea. And that included the light beacon, which signalled the beginnings and the safety of the harbour. Well, I'd experienced, of course, storms in the London area where I'd lived all of my life, but this was the first sea storm that I had experienced. And it will live with me forever. It wasn't the worst one that the island had ever got or ever had, but even so, I looked upon the sea in a different way. And I suppose most of us who have been in an experience somewhat similar can identify the sea as something which is serene and beautiful when the weather is lovely, but it can turn into a raging storm at the least signal and then it can wreak havoc. Now that's remained with me and I think if you've experienced anything like that, well hold on to it for a moment because it can actually lead us into the story that we heard this morning about Jonah and also Jesus stilling the storm. Because as we travel through life, we have patches which are calm and still, very fruitful, and enjoyable but all of us at some stage have the we encounter the storms of our life the parts of our life which are not so pleasant and which have to be lived through and managed and perhaps even understood although in some cases that is not the case and as we consider the story of Jonah and also of Jesus stilling the storm so we let them speak to us because although we might not realize it, we actually encounter and depend on Jesus being behind us and surrounding us with his love and care, even though we might not appreciate it. So let's turn to the story of Jonah, which we heard read so clearly and in detail. I think we have to remember that Jonah, we don't quite know when it was written. We don't quite know the context it was written in. And we also don't quite know how much is symbol and how much is very, very much description of facts. And I think we also have to realize that in the early biblical time when Jonah was written, certainly before the era of Jesus, the Jews who were not a seafaring nation 
in fact had a great fear of the sea. Biblical tradition actually suggested that the sea was the area of chaos and havoc. It was where evil lurked, and if you've read your Bible, you will have come across the word Leviathan, which was the great monster which inhabited the depths of the water. It personified the evil and the havoc and the threat which lay in the large bodies of water for the Jews. So what about Jonah? Let's turn to Jonah for a moment. We're, we're having a short session of sermons about Jonah, so we're looking at his life in pieces. And Jonah, as we heard last week, was called by God to go to Assyria, to Nineveh, to recall to the Assyrians the wrong that they had done. The, Assyri the Assyrian Empire was renowned for its conquering prowess and also for the cruelty in which it undertook the conquering um, of nations around about it. So he was called to go there to give them the judgment that they deserved, to call them to repentance and to make known to them that if they repented and turned from these ways, then they were within the bounds of a loving God. And Jonah really didn't want anything to do with this. I don't think he wanted them to be redeemed. Um, and I'm not sure that I would want to go to a large empire which my country had suffered from. So Jonah ignored the words of the Lord. In fact, he went to the port of Joppa, bought a passage on a ship, and was determined to sail out of the reach of, Lord, of, of the Lord into the western areas of presumably the Mediterranean Sea. So Jonah escaped, and then as we heard, events overtook his movement out of the reach of the Lord. And as we heard, as soon as the boat made its way into the sea, on its journey, the storm broke, all of the people were on the, the crew were afraid because the boat was in danger of sinking in the sort of storm. Jonah was sleeping under the deck. So as they were praying to all of their gods, then they realized Jonah was not with them. So they got him. They asked him all manner of questions about where he had come from and who he was. And Jonah, of course, with that guilty streak in him, because he knew that he was flouting the will of the Lord, he gave them the information. And then in the end, he volunteered, and they drew lots, and he was thrown overboard. So where does this take us? Well, we can delve into so many things about this incident, but for speed, we can just go to the final part, because in this extraordinary description, we hear that when he was thrown overboard, the storm stilled, but also Jonah was rescued. The whale here seems very extraordinary to our ears. We can't really explain it, but we can actually see that perhaps it stands for the grace and care of God, in symbol language, but Jonah was scooped up, he was saved. And during the time that he spent within the whale, or whatever, so he reflected on his situation. He knew what he had done, and he began to pray and think it through and repent, and he changed his ideas and decided that obedience was needed and he should undertake the task which had been allotted to him. But the point is that in that dire situation, Jonah knew the salvation of God. He was saved. God had been with him in a way that he couldn't understand, and perhaps we don't either. And the net result was that Jonah actually completed the task in a rather bad grace, I have to say, which the Lord had given him. He did go to Nineveh, but that part of the story perhaps we leave for another day. But what do we take from that? We see 
chaos being overthrown, we see a person being saved and given the stillness to think through a situation and come to another decision against that which he had earlier taken. So let's go from Jonah for a moment and let's go to our second story taken from the Gospel of St. Mark. This too is perhaps a very special story. I think probably we have got um, a shot on the screen which I found. So we come to Jesus on the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. A small boat which was quite normal in those days. The fishermen are on the Sea of Galilee which was notorious for its sudden storms. And one blew up there and the winds blew and howled and again the disciples thought that they were in danger of perishing. Jesus at this time was sleeping in the, the, the stern of the boat, as we can see from the artist there, and the water was sweeping into the boat, and I think probably the boat was in danger of sinking or at least being damaged. And in their panic that this was happening, so a sort of sense of anger came over them. There they were in this parlor state, and there Jesus was asleep in the boat. It rather suggested that there was a sense of not caring about the situation. So they roused him. And as we know, Jesus got up and he spoke to the storm. He spoke also, of course, to the disciples whilst doing this. So Jesus stilled their anxiety as he stilled the water. And then, of course, he chided the disciples for their lack of faith. And those are the moments that we need, too. One of the hymns that we all sing is, Be still for the presence of the Lord. And I think that speaks to us very, very clearly in scenes like this. And again, the disciples were awestruck. What kind of man is this that calms the sea? And I'm sure at the back of their minds, they had also that story of Jonah, which was so, so well known within their culture. And I'm sure that they related things together and saw Jesus as a very special person. And going on from this and leaving that slide for a moment, they were sure of this, of course, later in their discipleship following the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus because at that time they saw that Jesus was indeed a very special person. Someone who was able to empathize with human beings, he was in the boat alongside them, but with this divine quality which allowed an authority over the, naturals, uh, the natural conditions of sea and air and wind. It takes a lot of taking in, but that is what we're told. And Mark perhaps emphasizes this very much because his gospel does not include any mention of the nativity to introduce Jesus. Straight away he said, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ the Messiah, and this story backs it up, and was told later on to calm down and to try and give uh, young Christians, a young Christian church, um, security and strength and confidence as they face persecution for their faith. So I think we let these stories speak to us as much as we can. So how do we face times? Because as I've said earlier, in our lives we find the storms of life. We, we know jolly well that some of them are very lovely um, situations. We, we feel great joy as we travel through life and we see the nice things. We imagine the great joy of someone looking at the newborn baby, for example. At the moment outside, the bulbs are beginning to nudge through the soil and they're going to give a sign of spring shortly. 
and later in the year we'll see the, the, the bright flowers of nature and so on. And we also get joy from being human with emotions. We can actually experience joy. We can understand it and we can respond to it. So there are beautiful things in life. But we know jolly well that there are the reverse as well, which we would name as storms. We, we understand how awful certain illnesses can be. We can understand grief, bereavement. We can understand anxiety when people lose jobs. We can certainly understand so many things around things that happen to ordinary human beings. So we let these things, I think, speak to us. It's so necessary. A little while ago, I was reading a book by um, two well-known church people, Travelling Well. And as I got to the last chapter, they sort of put in ways in which when we were in difficult situations, we could actually find ways of strengthening our support. And I'm just going to identify three of them. Firstly, they, they sort of said, be honest, be realistic. Because you are Christians, you are not immune from the difficulties of life. It is part and parcel of life on earth. Some people are more lucky than others, perhaps, but others are not. So just accept that at some stage, this is going to happen. And when it does, sort of admit it. Don't shout it from the housetops, that's not expected. But there are certain people who can be trusted to hear what you say and not to repeat it to everybody. But when you actually speak out the problem, then you have named it. And when that happens, you can start working to overcome it or to sustain life while it goes on. But then we come to the part which we know the second suggestion, and it is so vital. And that is, even if you don't feel it, even if you feel completely lost and without Jesus in your life, then don't accept it, because you are not. You are just not receiving the signals clearly enough because of your situation. So go to the Bible, look at stories like Jonah and the stilling of the storm and many others. Look at the life of Jesus, how he reached out to people in their difficulties, to the lepers, to the injured, to the marginalized. He was a person of great love who wanted to draw people from the outskirts and the unloved areas of society into the love of Jesus. And we need to remember that because it includes us when we are in that situation. So it's very valuable to do that. And secondly, we need in fact almost to see Jesus in our lives too. To say, yes, we, we, we need to recount how Jesus has affected us and people that we are with. Now, I say that because, for me, I did like the Bible stories when I was young. But when I was five, my family um, encountered a, a dreadful tragedy, actually. And as a result, and almost immediately, um, I was separated from my parents. And there was no family, no social services. So I felt very alone and very, well, rejected. But at that moment, a neighbor who I would not have expected actually saw the situation and came and took me away into the safety of her house. And there have been others like that, perhaps not so dramatic, but in retrospect, I didn't notice it at the time, but in retrospect, I see the loving hand of, of God working through other people. And when you look perhaps at your situation, do try and see that happening. And perhaps also choose parts of the scriptures which speak to you. 
The Lord is my shepherd is a favorite. Um, the image of the shepherd is precious. And St. Paul's great statement that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And for me personally, if we can have the next slide, this one speaks so powerfully for me. It's an artist's impression of the Emmaus Road. And you can see the rather lush vegetation, which perhaps represents the troubled um, time that the two people in front are passing through. I don't know. It leaves it to the imagination, doesn't it? But the two, Clopas and possibly his wife, were walking back from Jerusalem after the crucifixion. And they were distressed. They were distraught. All of their fears in Jesus had been destroyed. And as we can see behind, we have the picture of Jesus who silently joined them, asked them their worries, and then set it all within scripture. And then at the end of this, joined them and shared the bread and wine, at which point the penny dropped and they knew that they had met their Lord. And I see that very much when I get down, that's one of the pictures I go to because I can see the strength of the Lord and I can see the enlightenment and the comfort he brings. And I can also imagine the two people in great joy going back to spread the news. And so for us too, when we spread the news, we bring the love of Jesus to other people and that helps us too. And just to say that that's what our church is doing at the moment on a Monday evening. It is actually coming to, a group of people are coming to our church out of love and concern and teaching people about finance. And there's so many ways that we can reach out to others through love that we ourselves have experienced. So those pictures of Jonah and of Jesus stilling the storm, they are so foundational and they lead us on in depth to explore how they can be shown and received in our lives. Amen.